Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of the Not Boring Book Club slash Self Help Me. And I'm with the one and only Jeff Green, the Brothers Green. And yesterday was such a good conversation. We discussed a big movie that's come out. It's probably the most discussed movie on Netflix right now, The Social Dilemma. So like most people who watch The Social Dilemma, I was horrified throughout. Social media has become a bit of a monster that's outside of the control or even understanding of its very creators. Is this as dangerous as the nuclear bomb? It sounds like a silly question, but when you're talking about the psychology of the entire human race being recorded down to the movement of your mouse, down to the where your eyeballs go on a screen, you know, The Social Dilemma does a wonderful job uh, personifying these sort of data quark vampire pirates that sit in these giant air-conditioned rooms full of computers picking all your data apart to lure you back in and it's not for your benefit it's a casino it's a casino that you invited into your pocket all day long that has the most sophisticated information about you everyone you know how you interact alexa is listening to every single conversation you have and deciding when it's relevant to try to pull you into her world to retreat into the comfort of your own artificial reality tell me to stop your progress will be saved if you return. Everybody's got a business model, right? Well, social media's model is the bummer model. And I forget what it stands for. It's a very clever thing, you know. It's like the right. dentist system. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the dentist system from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Another good system. My favorite is S. Separate entirely. And then he just walks off for no reason. Pizza's good. You're the one that's good. But the bummer system that Jaron Lanier talks about, it basically boils down to this. The most easy way to get you locked into an advertisement is to make you angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And the most easy way to make you angry is to lie about the person you think you're angry about. Now just imagine for a second that Wikipedia said, we're gonna give each person a different customized definition and we're gonna be paid by people for that. That's exactly what's happening on Facebook. It's exactly what's happening in your YouTube feed. So I'll, I'll date myself a little bit, but when I was in high school, two movies came out. One was Matrix and one was Minority Report. Tom Cruise with yeah. the pre-crime and the cool swipey screen. <laughs> And at right around the same time, people forget this wasn't that long ago, Google came out with AdSense. It was monetizing search by connecting ads to what you were searching for. And at that time, I, I don't think anybody working at Google quite realized what that was going to do. I don't think anybody at Google was really thinking like, this is going to turn us into the pod people from the matrix, right? And in the social dilemma, we are the pod people in the matrix, quite literally. Like they had some kind of, I thought they were a little corny, you know, the sort of dramatizations where uh, the avatar of the kid is uh, being manipulated by the people behind the screen. My analysis shows that going political with extreme center content has a 62.3% chance of long-term engagement. That's not bad. Nobody thought that was gonna happen. And nobody thought when they first started up Facebook, a few years after that, that Facebook was going to be able to influence elections. You know, it's the, the reality is, well, there are so many different forces at play. I mean, Facebook was really at first about finding hot girls at school or it was about figuring Literally. out who was going to be. Hotternot.com was the first yeah. Facebook, right? When I first started using Facebook, one of the killer apps of Facebook was to be able to look up your classes because it was also restricted universities at that time. No way would anyone using Facebook or designing Facebook imagine that, you know, like half of the world would be using Facebook someday and that Facebook would be called into Congress to answer for election fraud. Senator, I'm not aware of that. And that they would be facing such deep questions about are they affecting the very ability of democracy to continue? Or for that matter, are they a force for democratization in places like Myanmar? And, you know, nobody could have dreamed of that. The idea of early Silicon Valley was the marketplace of ideas. When we are freely able to express ourselves, the greatest ideas will rise to the top, like the cream. But the cream will rise to the top, oh yeah. 
And by the way, I don't know if cream actually rises to the top. I've never checked that. Does it? I've heard it does. I don't know. The cream of the crop. And there is no one that does it better than the macho man Randy Savage. My favorite evidence is music. Uh, you know, with the progressive arc of history, with the availability of creative outlets, tools, technologies, free time, money, less death, less murder. We're, we're less likely to get murdered. We have every situation is better and we have more access, and yet the quality of music doesn't seem to be Jimi Hendrix. I don't know about you, the recently signing on to Netflix, even that has started to feel predictable. Um, Literary fiction today in the U.S., like almost every story you read fits into the sort of 10 basic paradigms. There's <laughs> the Brooklynite who's having a quarter-life crisis. There's the college professor who's pursuing a romantic relationship with a student who's younger. There is the immigrant to London or New York who is caught between worlds. Like tens of thousands of books that are all, you know, good, but they're essentially... I mean, they're the new versions of genre fiction. They all fit the same model. Nonfiction's even worse. It's always like a picture of a bicycle on an all-white background that just says bicycle of the mind. It's like one word like pulse or growth or hack. How, or how <laughs> unicycles created the modern world. <laughs> Everything is much more predictable. Why? Why? Why did it go that way? Literally, I thought when we put cameras and music equipment and all the information in the world in the hands of an entire generation and said, you have the freedom to use this, I thought we were going to get clerks times a thousand. I thought we were going to get, you know, once upon a time in Mexico with the, with the gun guitar, but it's in 3D and somebody shot it on their iPhone. Like, I thought we were going to get crazy, unbounded creativity. What we got instead is mumble rap. I remember being so high on this song. <laughs> the lowest common denominator, I get bitches, I got doors on my thing, I do lean. The lowest common denominator of what a cool rapper could be, we got that. The lowest common denominator of what a self-help book could be, we got that. And the reason for that is because nobody's getting paid anymore, it seems like. So the money has dropped out. Let me um, just attend to my newest member of my family first. And I'll oh yeah, we got a baby? <laughs> I'll bring my little baby on camera. There we go. This guy. Hey. He was born in the middle of the pandemic. He was born in the world that we're talking about. He's uh, almost five months. In a way, I mean, what we're talking about, 10 reasons to delete your social media account or whether social media is good or bad or whether the internet's good or bad or computers are good and bad, that ship has sailed. This is the world now. Pandora doesn't go back in the box. He only comes out. And That's right. you and I are going to be the old curmudgeons who talk about the old way back in my day when we didn't have all this social media. But oh, I, guys, never, I never thought I would, but I'm already there. Back in my day, we got our days. porn from a dumpster. The question for guys like this, is not whether social media should exist, but how should it exist and how should I use it? How should it be part of my life? You know, you ask like, why, why is everything in front of you mumble rap or um, self, you know, bad self-help books? But there's kids who listen to all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's kids who are listening to like Cuban throat singing. And there's kids who are listening to Chinese opera. And there's kids who are listening to like very progressive, hardcore, met new metal. All of it's available, but you're right. Like, do you find it? And the algorithm, unfortunately, as much as it allows you to find stuff that's obscure and kind of on the long tail of things, the logic of it is to get the most attention and click. And the way you get the most attention and click is unfortunately to optimize for the lowest common denominator because you're going to have the largest audience. To me, actually, there's more quality than ever. It's just so much of it, it gets diluted and nobody pays for it. In the movie, it was all about the political and social implications of social media. It wasn't about the fact that everybody's listening to crap music. Democracy itself is under threat. 
spreads depression and suicide. It creates social alienation. It sort of rips the connections that you have in a society between people. It turns people against each other. It creates political polarization. And like many things that are happening today, the coronavirus pandemic, various political issues, Black Lives Matter, your version of that reality is completely different depending on what social media bubble you're in. When you go to Google and type in climate change is, you're going to see different results depending on where you live. In certain cities, you're going to see it autocomplete with climate change is a hoax. In other cases, you're going to see climate change is causing the destruction of nature. And that's a function not of what the truth is about climate change, but about where you happen to be Googling from and the particular things that Google knows about your interests. Everything that someone says has an element of truth to it. I present that as an option. This is a pragmatist uh, uh, interpretation of reality. In the world, in a world, in a world, 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 where you are going to have access to every single point of view ever. It seems to me the only logical thing is to assume there's something right about all of them. And then just, yeah, every now and then you'll be burned. All these people believed that there was no one truth. There was no truth with a capital T. We are all seeking truth, and truth is like a path, okay? It's, it's true insofar as it gets you moving forward. But two paths can diverge, and they can come back together. So the, the philosophers I've loved encourage you to embrace the, the best argument of your opposition knowing it can enlighten your path. It can bring more information to your path and help you move forward. Is quitting by and large just kind of the best idea we have until we figure out a, a better way to orient ourselves? Darren Lanier, he said, all we're asking is that a small number of people step away from social media so that we at least have a space, a small precious space for deliberation, for discussion, for reason. The way we socialize is being designed by a small cadre of people who all go to the same university and all come from the same background and are very lacking in diversity, are overwhelmingly male, are overwhelmingly wealthy, and are overwhelmingly from California, go to Stanford, work for the same five companies. And that's the problem. If you think that users, or shall we call them citizens, or people should have a choice and how they exist online. And since we exist online all the time now, even when we're out in the world, we have a computer with an internet connection in our pocket at yeah. all times. It mediates our very reality everywhere we go, but we don't really have a say. Well, you could always walk away. You can always hear 10 reasons why you should quit your social media account, but you, you can't opt out. The world outside is created in the image of Silicon Valley now. It's everywhere. You read Putnam's Bowling Alone, right? Yep. Bowling. Bowling. It's all about sociological study and how Americans used to be really known as associational people, really highly social. Everyone went to church. Everyone belonged to a bowling league, as the name comes from. Now they're bowling alone. You would be part of a knitting circle or a book club or whatever. And the average American was a member of two or three clubs like that. And they could wow. list <laughs> half a dozen really good friends. Today, the majority of adult Americans cannot list a single best friend besides their spouse. And hmm. the majority of even Christian religious adherents do not attend church. It was like before an ideology existed to bring a group of people together, to secure a community. Now it's like the community only exists to perpetuate the ideology. I bring this up because this long predates social media. I mean, this was happening in the 80s and 90s before Facebook or MySpace or Friendster or whatever was even around. Um, people were just socializing less. They were spending less time with their friends and family. And what happens when that happens is you don't have to like engage in the messy reality of socializing with people who are different. Than you. All the feedback. Yeah, the feedback. You don't have to test out those ideas. You know, when you're with members of your family or your friends, even though they like you, they're not going to agree with you on everything. So everything you say gets some feedback and it gets a little qualified because, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you were a little out on the limb there. We're stuck inside. We're overworked. We stare at screens all day. <sighs> we don't exercise. We never see nature. We're constantly shown images that are upsetting. And so... <laughs> 
like whatever whatever thin thread is holding our psyches together is just getting like pulled so hard and <laughs> all it takes is a little bit of do you want your upsetting images for the day okay here you go it's no, like clockwork it orange here we go <laughs> Okay, Myanmar, white supremacy, uh, yeah, riots. Ah. If enough people decide, you know what, actually, this is a bit lame. And I think that's what's happening with, you know, Generation Z. And uh, I guess the younger kids are called alpha now. Um, really? That's my first time hearing that. They're not alphas at all. <laughs> no, this, this uh, you know, this big boogeyman that is social media could evaporate just as fast as it blew up in the first place. And a better model could emerge. But my cynical side would also say it's not going to emerge because it's better or better for us. It's going to emerge because people engage with it more. And that's the key. Yes. And it needs to be profitable. So yep. we need to figure out what engages people but doesn't turn them uh, mentally ill and what is profitable without manipulating people's willpower. <laughs> and let and that's me, the tricky part. Let me add in your idea. We're going to use the P word, public funding. My first video that appeared on television was on PBS. I owe a lot of my early success to PBS. Um, I watched a lot of PBS. My mom and dad's favorite stuff was to watch was like old greats like Nat King Cole on PBS at three o'clock in the afternoon while we're having a late brunch. PBS is great and it costs nothing and we're always trying to get rid of it. And when I look at, what do I love? Comedy. Okay, who are my favorite comedians? I've always noticed they're all Canadian. And you mentioned earlier, the reason that is, is because Canada gives 10 times, what did you say, 10 times the funding for a smaller country? Yeah, yeah. Canada gives funding in any field you can imagine, from comedy, to make a movie, to make TV, music, whatever. So you've got all these stealth Canadians who come down to the United States to make it big because they've gotten the seed funding in Canada. And here in Sweden, it's the same thing. Sweden is the country, the single country that exports the third highest amount of music in the world after the United States and the United Kingdom, which is bananas because what? Sweden only has 10 million people. So there's 10 And they million... created Spotify. Yeah, yeah. So there's 10 million potential future ABBAs here who can get funding from the government to study art, to study music, to become wow. you know, the next Hollywood star. And you can get funding here to do a startup. And there are many different like channels for you to actually do your art. There's publicly funded television. There's publicly funded newspapers and journals. There's publicly funded uh, movie production studios. So for a tiny country, like Sweden punches way above its weight when it comes to like creating all this great art and ideas and content. And it returns tremendous value back to Sweden, but it also makes Sweden really very famous worldwide. Yeah. And that's a good thing for all Swedes. The U.S. could do this, and it does do this. I mean, it's got the National Endowment of the Arts, and it's got PBS, and there's there is a lot of funding out there, but today there's not a reason for it. Like back in the Cold War, you know, it was all about pushing the American way of life out into the world and, and really showing everyone that America is great and creative and innovative and a beautiful place full of people who can do anything and that was such a that was such an important national security thing back then and today it's 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 like the idea is well if you're good enough you'll make it somehow but none of us want to pay for it and the government doesn't want to pay for it either and everybody listening out there today i mean ask yourself how many subscriptions do you actually have how many when's the last time you bought an album when's the last time you bought a piece of art from? last time i bought an app was tinder gold because I was lonely. I think that could help us get through this transition period. Have we answered the question? My answer to the question, should you quit social media, is if you're asking that question, you're probably one of the good ones. And so we need you to be posting your thoughts that aren't so inflammatory. Trusting that the two people who see them might have been impacted 10 times as much as the 100 people who would have seen your, your angry post. They don't even remember what's going on. So impact those one or two people. Please, please keep sharing your voice. Be even louder with it. Keep posting. But let's remember that the world changes very quickly, right? And this new social media landscape was new. That's why they called it new media. And there's going to be a new, new media. And in this time, I just, I, I'm curious about everybody else's ideas about what would be a good way for us to organize. I mean, the bottom line is we got to get together. Is that your takeaway, Jeff? Do you say quit, stay? What do you think? Final word. I say use intentionally. Don't don't use the way that is the easiest way. 
the easiest way is not the best way. Social media is a very powerful tool. It can really help you stay connected with your friends and family all over the world. I have people that I know in over 100 countries who I want to stay connected with and who I get a lot of value from. I can use social media in an intentional way, and I can use social media in the dumbest, most vacant eye, disappointing way possible. The key is that it's a tool, and you can use the tool in your life for the things that you want to use it for. Mm -hmm. As long as you remain aware. Please like and subscribe for more discussions like this. I don't hear a lot of discussions like this, except for when I'm talking to my brother. So that's why I had to lure him out onto this podcast, uh, just so I could share it with some of you all. So please let us know if you enjoyed it so it'll be easier to get him back. Another book, another discussion, another dire circumstance that upon further inspection, maybe we're okay. Maybe we're going to we're going to we're going to get out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> we have ideas. All right, brother. Um let's end the recording here and then I'll say goodbye properly. Let's see. All right. Let me go downstairs. The recorded file will be converted to MP4 when the meeting ends. Okay.